Hello there, everybody, and welcome back to my crash course in formal logic. This is a very important lesson. Finally, we're going to test arguments with truth tables, tell if they're valid or invalid, and using do that using all the skills we developed in the previous lessons. Now, so essentially, it's the moment we've all been waiting for. Finally, we get to do something like we did with Venn diagrams for categorical logic. Now we're going to do truth tables for propositional logic. Now, validity means there's no possibility of all true premises and a false conclusion. Invalidity is the opposite. There's at least one such possibility. Now, since the rows on our truth table running left to right represent possibilities, we can show validity with truth tables. It's basically a three-step process. Number one, symbolize your arguments consistently using simple uh, uh, capital letters to represent simple propositions. Then draw a single truth table containing a column for each of the premises and the conclusion. And when you're done doing that, you just look left to right along the rows to see if you can find a row where all the premises are true and the conclusion false. If there is such a row, the argument's invalid. If not, it's a valid argument. Now, of course, we're going to need to do some examples in order to get our minds wrapped around this. How about this? If, we'll invest, if we invest more money in police forces, crime will decrease, but we won't invest such money. Therefore, crime will not decrease. Let's be consistent with what we let each letter represent. I'm going to let M represent investing more money and C be crime decreasing. And since we won't invest more money, does that mean that crime will not decrease? Again, let's do the truth table. Now remember, when we set up the rows for our truth tables, we want to take the number 2 to the power of however many sentence variables we're working with. In this case, we're dealing with two sentence variables, and we'll have a four-row truth table. Then I'm going to assign truth values, uh, true and false, in columns for the simple sentence letters by using the half-on, half-off method. Kind of like so. For the first sentence letter, half-on, two t's, half-off, two falses. And in the next sent column, uh, I cut that two on, two off, down to one on, one off. TF, TF, straight down. Now we need a column to handle that horseshoe, and I'm only going to put an F, and we'll need a column, of course, to handle the tilde. And lastly, we'll need a column to handle the tilde C for the conclusion. Notice a column for each of the premises and a column for the conclusion. Now using the first two columns, I can calculate for the M horseshoeing to C. It's just going to get an F where M is true and F uh, C is false. Now for tilde m, I just use the column in blue over to the far left, and I switch their values straight to the opposite. No problem there. Same thing happens with the c. Now, once I've done this, I'm pretty well done with my truth table. The real question is, what am I going to do with it? What I want to do is I want to look and see if there's a row left to right where all the premises turn out true and the conclusion false. Let's re-examine that table. Now here's our truth table. I'm going to go ahead and highlight the premises columns here in the green. Do you see any rows in which they're both uh, all the premises turn out true? Well, I see th three and four are the rows that they turn out true. I'm going to go ahead and highlight here the conclusion column. But before I go any further, I'm going to put stars. That's my typical technique beside the rows where all the premises are true. Then I take a look at the conclusion column. Notice there is one row where the premises turned out true and the conclusion false. And when I see that sort of thing, what I usually do is I circle a star. Stars mean here's the rows where all the premises are true, and then I put a circle around one if I find a row in which the conclusion is false. And that invalidates the argument. There is a way, call it a row, call it a possibility, of all true premises and a false conclusion. That is, by definition, an invalid argument. Well, let's do another example just to wrap our minds more around the concept. If voter election fraud occurs, American people will not respect their leaders. And if they don't respect their leaders, then the national security will be weakened. Does it follow that if voter election fraud occurs, then national security will be weakened? Well, I'm going to use F for fraud occurring and tilde R for people not respecting. And tilde R implies W according to the second premise. Consequently, if fraud occurs, will national security be weakened? This is the argument we're going to test. Now, I'm going to need a larger truth table here. Since I have three propositional variables, I'm going to need to have an eight-row truth table. And that means I'm going to go half on, half off for the first few rows. And then I'm going to go... Uh, half of what I did in the previous column, switch to half of that next. Uh, eventually, I'm going to have to go down to eighths. So here's what we're going to do first. For the F column, I'm going to go half on. That's four on, four off for that column. And then 
After I'm done doing that, I'm going to switch to two on, two off. See how that works? And then, since I cut uh, four down to two, two is going to go down to one. There. I've set up my table with all my propositions assigned every possible combination of trues and falses. Now I need to fill out the rest of the table. Uh, for tilde r, I'm going to have to just flip-flop the values in the r column. And so I'm going to get f, two f's and two t's all the way down. For this column, I need to find where f is true and r is t uh, tilde r rather is false. Now I see in uh, rows one and two that that happens. And those are the only ones I think I need to really pay attention to, since I get most the f's in the column for f anyways. So, moving on, can you find a row where tilde r is true and w is false? Well, I can see that in four, and I can see it in eight. And all the rest of the time, it turns out true. And now finally for our conclusion column. Can you find rows in which f is true and w is false? I see that happening in 2 and 4. So I'll put f's in those columns. All the rest look to me like they turn out fine. And here we go again. We've done a column for every premise and the conclusions. So now we need to look and see is there, is there a row with all true premises and a false conclusion. Well, once again, here's our truth table. And here are our two premises, highlighted in green at the top. Now down here, I see in rows 5, 6, and 7, the premises turned out true, both of them. So let's take a look at the conclusion column. After, of course, we star the rows where all our premises turned out true. Now in that conclusion column, highlighted here in yellow, it looks to me like we always got trues every time the premises were true. So what does that mean? That means the argument is valid. There was no way for the premises to be true and the conclusion false. There's no row or possibility of true premises and a false conclusion. That is by definition a valid argument. Now let's take on a real monster just for practice's sake. How about this argument? Lotus, four premises and a conclusion. Now, this is going to be very difficult. We're going to have to take it by the numbers and work our way through it carefully. But remember, truth tables are easy. As long as you follow the steps, you're not going to get tripped up with this. So, first thing to notice is we've got four propositional variables in that argument, and that means we're going to have to have a truth table that is 16 rows long. That's the longest truth table we've tried in these lessons, and we set up all the possible uh, values of combinations, rather, of trues and falses. We're going to have to cut into halves quite an awful lot. In fact, to get down to sixteenths, I'd have to say a very awful lot. But it's nothing we can't handle. We'll just set up a column for each one of our propositional variables and we'll go half on, half off. After that, we'll go by uh, quarters. After that, we'll divide down to eighths. And after that, we'll divide on down to sixteenths. It's not really going to be hard as long as we just take it by the numbers. So first things first, half on, half off means 8 true, 8 false for A. Now since we went by 8, we have to go by 4's in column R. So let's go ahead and put 4 on, 4 off, 4 on, 4 off. Then after that, we're going to divide down into half of that. Instead of 4 on, 4 off, we're going to go with 2 on, 2 off. And then finally, you always end on your last propositional variable with 1 on, 1 off, 1 on, 1 off, all the way down. So here's the argument. We have to start making columns for our premises and conclusions. So let's start building up towards it. First off, I want to get those tildes out of the way. They're the easiest to handle. So any value I had for, say, A, I can just flip-flop it and get the values for tilde A, right? So 8 off, 8 on. And for C, same thing. Instead of TF, TF, we're going to have F, T, F, T. And for tilde N, Flip-flop, two off, two on, all the way down. That was pretty easy. Now I need to start building up towards those two-place connectives, and I'll just lay out in advance exactly what my columns are going to look like. I know I'm going to need a column for tilde A wedge R, and I'm pretty well set up to fill out this column. Now look at this second premise in this argument. Uh, it's a conjunction, but it's negated. I need to handle the conjunction first, and then I need a column for the negation thereof. So I need two columns that will look like this, n dot tilde c, and then a column over to the right of that that negates that whole conjunction. 
And then I can go to R horseshoeing to C. That's our third premise. Finally, C horseshoes to tilde N and our conclusion at the very end. Now it's just a matter of playing it out by the numbers. I can get this column, a, a tilde A wedge R, by just using the R and tilde A columns. The only time where I get falsehoods for both A and R, tilde A and R uh, is in these four rows. All the rest turn out true. And as for this, I'm only going to put trues in the uh, rows in which N and tilde C turn out true. That's one time in every four. And all the rest are going to get Fs. Now the next column is the negation of this one, so that's going to be just as easy as flip-flopping the values that we just gave to N dot tilde C. So far, so good, right? Now as far as R horseshoeing to C, take a look at the columns in blue. I only see true for R and false for C in rows 2 and 4, and also in 10 and in 12. So consequently, all the other rows turn out true by definition of the material conditional. Same thing goes for this column. I want to see where C is true and tilde N is uh, false, and I get that in 1, 5, 9, and 13. Other otherwise, the conditional sentence turns out to be okay, true. And for the conclusion, A wedge C, well, we're only going to get put falsehoods where both of these turn out false, and that's pretty rare by com uh, comparison. All the rest of the time, they turn out true. Now we've got a column for each of our premises and a column for the conclusion. So what are you going to do now? Same thing as always. Look for the row where all the premises are true and the conclusion is false. Look for the invalidating row, that is. Now here's our truth table once again. And these, don't let your eyes fool you, uh, these are your premises row columns. Don't be fooled into thinking that the uh, column that's not highlighted there in the middle, the n dot tilde c, is a premise column. It is not. These are the columns highlighted in yellow that we want to pay attention to. Now I put stars, look at the numbers over to your left, I put stars wherever we had all true premises. Uh, starring those rows is usually how I get started working on my arguments. Now finally, over to the far right, I've highlighted in the conclusion column uh, the conc uh, what conclusions turned out to be on each of those rows, number 3, number 11, number 15, and number 16. Do you see a row in which all the premises turned out true and the conclusion false? There you got it in the red star, very bottom uh, right hand corner. There is a way, namely when A, R, N, and C are all false, for the premises to be true and the conclusion false. That means this argument is not valid. So what you're always doing is you're looking for the invalidating row on an argument. You want to see if there's a way, call it a row, call it a possibility, of all true premises and a false conclusion. If you find such a way or a row or possibility, you have invalidated your argument. Otherwise, then the argument would count as valid. Now remember, just take these uh, truth tables in baby steps. They can be long and tedious, but that's about all there is to a truth table. Just remembering that truth tables are easy and they're only going to get hard for you if you start to skip steps or try to tackle columns uh, too swiftly and maybe by handling two connectives at a time. That's the only time that they're going to get hard. You're not going to be intimidated by any argument that you have to do a truth table for. They're all about pretty much the same. So be patient, be methodical, and the rest is going to be just child's play for you. Well, this has been a relatively short lesson by my standards. Uh, truth tables are an important part of uh, propositional logic, especially truth tables for arguments. I'll give you more exercises later on, but basically this, uh, uh, this lesson covers everything you need to know. Basically, all you need to remember, create a column for all the premises and the conclusion, and once you've created uh, such columns, you just need to know how to interpret your truth table. Look for a row left to right with all true premises and a false conclusion. If you find it, the argument is invalid. If, it's, if you can't find any such thing, the argument's valid. So that's all for now. Wait for my logic lessons coming up later, and I'll give you some exercises on this particular lesson in future appendices to this lesson. Thank you for your patience and time. Have fun.